Good morning team, Justin Dunaway, uh, live from Portland, Oregon, it's, uh, 6 a.m., still a little dark outside. Um, I am lead faculty in our spine division and I teach our eight-week online persistent pain management. Um, if you're looking to dive into that course, into that eight-week um, journey from neurophysiology all the way through clinical application, next cohort starts um, this Monday. So if you've got any interest, or you've been thinking about it, now's the time to pull the trigger. Today, I would like to talk about one of my favorite topics that we hit in the, in the pain course, um, but just one of my favorite topics in general is sleep and sleep dysfunction, but more importantly, what do we do with it clinically? And team, um, there's lots and lots of really great information coming out about sleep and sleep dysfunction, and I think it's generally agreed upon um, that, uh, that, that humans need about eight hours of sleep. And if we start to get less than that, especially consistently, um, things start to come off the tracks. Tons of great stuff. If you're interested in sleep science, you know, checking out Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Um, there's a great new podcast from a, a neuroscience researcher out of Stanford called Huberman Lab. The first four episodes on sleep are spectacular. Um, I always... Uh, uh, and. Uh, yeah, I always read before I sleep. I'm getting the message in here. This is awesome. Yeah, I think having a good sleep routine before sleep, we're going to hit on that, is super important. But anyway, so Huberman Lab podcast, M Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep, um, great stuff. But all you really have to do is hop on PubMed and type in sleep dysfunction into the search bar. And what you're going to find is tons and tons and tons of relevant uh, research. And it seems like new research is coming out almost daily um, looking at sleep and sleep dysfunction. Um, but what we know is that when you have poor sleep or less than adequate sleep, um, it seems to correlate with a ton of negative stuff. I'm just going to kind of give you a blast of, of some of the information that's coming out now. Um, we know that, that sleep dysfunction can be an independent predictor of transition from acute to chronic pain. It seems to correlate with increased healthcare utilization, increased opioid use, decreased outcomes, especially after surgery. Um, it seems to sleep dysfunction seems to go hand in hand with increased levels of systemic inflammation. Um, there's this really cool study that, that tracks humans um, in their diet and their sleep over a period of time. And what they found is that poor quality sleep predicted next day poor food choices and then poor food choices predicted all kinds of stuff. So sleep dysfunction actually drives some of that stuff. When we look at the psych journals, we see that sleep dysfunction suppresses our ability to, to suppress or get rid of unwanted thoughts, negative emotions. It makes us less stress resilient. Um, it also, when we look at it from a, from a research end, if we take a bunch of people in a room and give them a bunch of cognitive tasks and then short sleep them, they fail those tasks the next morning. Um, Long-term sleep dysfunction is related to cognitive decline in older adults. Um, and we've seen it. It's related to cardiovascular disease, to metabolic disease, to increased mortality rates. Sleep dysfunction is bad. Um, when we think about it, Clinically, we tend, to, we tend to think about it with patients that walk in the door with pain. If they check the box that says, I'm not sleeping well, or if the patient said to me that, that they're not sleeping well because of their pain, we might dive into that. But realize it's not just for pain patients as well. There's actually a new study that just came out last year by Kahalen looking at endurance athletes, looking at their sleep quantity and their training load and a bunch of other metrics. And one of the things they found is that sleep quantity or poor sleep quantity was, an in, was a predictor of of injury rates throughout the season, independent of workload. So now what we're seeing is that, that in normal, healthy, athletic humans, um, sleep dysfunction can be a predictor of injury. You know, we're not great at injury prevention, but I think it's because we're looking at some of the wrong stuff. Sleep seems to be one of the right things. Now, where it gets interesting is here. Um, another study came out uh, in uh, end of 2019 by Matsumoto called The Prevalence of Sleep Disturbance. And they just looked across studies that looked at, at sleep dysfunction, just trying to get an idea of what is the population prevalence of, of some sleep disorders. And when we look at short sleep, which is defined as less than or six hours or less than sleep, um, the, just the general population can report uh, up to 53% of the population 
can report short sleep. Now think about that huge list that I just gave you of all the things that can go wrong with chronic short sleep in almost half of our population is short sleeping right now. And then we look at non-restorative sleep. And no, restorative sleep is simply defined as, you know, I wake up and I feel uh, rested, ready to go, or I wake up and I feel tired. Non-restorative sleep, waking up feeling tired after a full night's sleep, um, is an independent predictor of all kinds of stuff. There's a study that looked at patients or people with chronic widespread pain, tracked them over a year, and then looked at the ones whose pain um, resolved and uh, restful sleep was an independent predictor of pain resolution in chronic widespread pain uh, patients. So thinking about non-restorative sleep, almost four or up to 42% of the population reports non-restorative sleep. Team, that's a massive amount of humans and the, the long-term downstream effects of, of chronic non-restorative sleep and chronic short sleep are massive. <clears throat> so what do we do about it? Well, step one is the patients that walk in the door, it's not just the patients that say, hey, yeah, I'm having trouble sleeping. And it's not the patients that mark sleep on, the, on, the, on your checkbox uh, intake form. And just like every patient through the door gets fitness, every patient through the door, I'm having a conversation with about sleep. How are you sleeping? What does that mean to you? Tell me a little bit about that. And then we're going to dive into some of the metrics. And if we're detecting some, some dysfunction up front, I think it's important to have a baseline. Uh, the PSQI, Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, is a really nice, um, is a really nice, well-researched uh, tool for kind of getting that sleep baseline and track and change over time. Um, but that's not good enough. Once we, once we have that number, once we have that baseline, we've got to dive into intervention if there's dysfunction or really dive in to see what, what behavioral interventions might be effective here. Right. So this is where sleep hygiene gets important. And I think it's really important to have a list. Um, and I do, and just a printed out list of, of your 12 or 14 or however many bullet items that, that you really think are important. Um, and again, there's lots of sleep hygiene lists out there and there's a ton of overlap between them. Um, you, can, you can just dump sleep hygiene into Google and find lots of stuff. I, I have kind of a cheat now. I'll, I'll allude to that here in a second. Um, but so we go in with this list, but I think it's important that we don't just give the patient a list of, of the 12 sleep hygiene stuff and say, you know, these are the, the, these are the things that good sleepers do. We need to work on that. We kind of like Sarah comes in with back pain and we evaluate her and say, okay, Sarah, you've got some weak glutes. Your quads are a little bit weak. Your hamstrings are kind of tight. Um, you're, you're lacking, so you're a little stiff into some hip flexion and internal rotation and you're, you're a little stiff into some lumbar flexion. Go work on that for, for a month and then let me know how that goes. Right. What we've got to do is evaluate the patient's sleep and sleep dysfunction and then break down the pieces and use a, a shared decision making approach and a great exposure approach to build up good sleep habits, just like we would build up um, physical resiliency, just like we would build up good exercise habits or good training habits. Right. So thinking about a sleep hygiene list and um, I like, um, I, I, have, I have one that I printed out from the Stanford Sleep Hygiene Group. And only because at the top of the page, it says Stanford Sleep Hygiene Research Team or whatever. Because um, uh, patients don't know who I am. They don't know who Matthew Walker, whoever, whatever I pulled off the internet is. But, but when you see the Stanford logo at the top, what, what most humans know is, ooh, there's a lot of smart people at Stanford. Um, so it buys me a little, bit of, a little bit of credibility when we start talking about this right off the bat. Um, but then we sit down and we go over the list. Bullet by bullet by bullet, we talk about each one. And the first thing I want to know is, of these things, which do you do well and which do you do poor? And we talk about sleep hygiene. You know, most of the, most of the lists, you're going to see things like sleep duration, right? Eight hours. Um, we're looking at sleep wake, consistent sleep wake times. Do you go to bed at the same time? Do you wake up at the same time? What's your room environment like? Is it dark? Is it cool? Is it quiet? What do you do in your room? The bedroom should be reserved for sleep and sex only. Um, so are you doing, are, are you doing, are you watching TV in bed? Are you answering emails on your phone? Are you working on, are you doing patient notes or whatever um, from your laptop in bed? 
Um, thinking about when was your last caffeine intake? When was your last alcohol intake? When was your last, when, what do you do with uh, screen time? When is your last kind of artificial light intake? How about large meals before bed? When do you eat dinner? Do you snack? What's your meal timing look like? Um, if you can't fall asleep, what do you do? What's your routine around laying in bed trying to fall asleep? How does that work for you? Um, do you exercise regularly? If so, when do you do that throughout your day? Exercise is important, but exercise timing is important as well. If you're hitting a nasty workout at 8 p.m. every night, um, that's, that's not conducive to good sleep. Um, do you have a pre-sleep routine? Uh, somebody in the chat said that they, uh, that they read for 30 minutes every night before bed. I think that's great. There's so much value in having a routine, a specific relaxing things that you do in order every night to kind of trigger your brain to say, okay, cool, it's, it's time to go to bed. Um, and then are you a napper? How do you time your naps? Where do those, where do those fall within your day? How much sleeping are you doing midday? Is that a thing that we need to address? And then there's a, I'm not going to dive deep into this, but there's some really cool research behind morning light exposure, getting out, um, getting out outside and where the light's not blocked by windows or there's not a, not a filter between you and the natural light and getting light exposure, um, somewhere in this three hour window right after you wake up kind of resets your circadian rhythms uh, to, to, to cue you up to fall asleep at the end of the day. Um, so there's a lot of value in that. So those are usually like my top 13 things that we'll go through. We'll sit down and talk about each one of those patients. And like I said, I'm not going to give you the list. We're going to walk through the list and I want to know which of these things do you do well and which of these things do you do poor. It's really important to, to not just focus on the bad, but focus on the good as well. Once I've got that list of things that the patient has self-identified as not doing well, this is where the shared decision-making comes in because there are going to be things that I think are really important um, that the patient is not quite ready to work on. And if we don't, we don't come to an agreement there, it's not going to work well, right? So I've got this list of four or five things that Sarah says she doesn't do well. Now the next question is, okay, of these four things, which do you think is the most important? And which of these things do you think you'd be ready to make some changes in today with a little bit of help, a little bit of guidance? And this is where it gets important. And this is where we've got to kind of step away from our ego. Team, if Sarah comes in and says that she gets five hours of sleep a night, her sleep-wake times are all over the place, not consistently. Uh, she watches TV in bed and she has a cup of coffee with dinner every night. Those four things are pretty negative. I want to get rid of her. Um, I, the first thing I want to do is, is think about sleep duration and sleep wake times. Those are things that I think are super important. Sarah is not ready to mess with those yet. She's also not, uh, she's, she doesn't feel like the TV and bed thing is, is important because she falls asleep. There's a lot of research that says that doesn't matter even if you're sleeping, it's not quality sleep, uh, but we're not there yet. Sarah says that, uh, you know, I, I could, I could, I'd be willing to talk about this caffeine before bed thing. All right, Sarah and I have different priorities, but my priorities don't matter. Sarah's priorities are the ones that are going to get done. And team, success, little successes are the things that buy the capital for the next goal, right? So I'm going to table the things that I think are important, and we're going to dive into the caffeine thing. That's the thing that Sarah said she was ready to get after. Let's do it. So Sarah has a cup of coffee every night before bed. Step one, we can't just say, all right, Sarah, don't do that. Um, let's say, okay, let's, let's look at your week and let's pick three days next week that it makes sense that you're going to have caffeine no later than four. That's it. Just three days. You can do the rest of your routine, but let's pick the three days that it would be easiest for you to do that. Once you do that, then next week, let's shoot for, let's shoot for five to seven days of caffeine at four. Once you're good, at, once we're nailing that, let's bump that back to, let's see if we can bump some of those back to noon, right? So we're just going to do a graded exposure approach with many successes, bumping that back within a safe window. Once she's knocked that out of the park, now we sit back down with the list and say, all right, Sarah, you're doing well there. Now we've got three things left on, the, left on this list. You did awesome with that one. What are we going to tackle next? Right. And then maybe Sarah's ready to talk about screen time before bed or sleep duration or whatever. And then we set up the great exposure program the same way. The key is we can't do everything at once because it's wildly overwhelming. The other important thing is my priorities and the patient's priorities may not be the same. 
And that's fine. It doesn't matter. We'll get to my thing eventually, but only if we start with where the patient, we meet the patient where they are and work with the patient to, to drive their goals forward. Many successes breed confidence to, to, to tackle more daunting goals, right? So we want to make sure that we get after that. Um, at the end of the day, the key to this stuff is simple. It's looking at this just like we look at any other intervention. Let's dive in deep with the patient. Let's have real good conversations around each of the things on this list. Let's figure out where their dysfunction is. Let's figure out what the patient is ready to work on, meet the patient where they're at, and build a program to drive them forward in these things. The last piece of this is, it's really important to front load this with the patients, is you will not see change overnight here. This stuff takes a little bit of time, and the more of these things that we can shift consistently for the longer period of time, the better you're going to feel. The goal is always eight hours or more sleep, eight to 10 hours of sleep, and restful sleep. You wake up feeling rested. And this is a really nice start to get after these things. And if, if we get through all this stuff and the patient's still having significant sleep dysfunction, there, not everything is within our scope, right? There are, um, there are sleep medicine specialists that can get in and do some, some more diagnostic exams and there's all kinds of medicalization, but behavior change is always the first step. And I think this is a really nice approach to doing that. All right, so um, make sure that we're, we're talking to every patient through the door about sleep. Realize that 50% of the population has sleep dysfunction and the chronic sleep dysfunction has massive downstream effects. Looking at sleep with every human is just as important as looking at exercise and fitness with every human, no matter what they're in the door for. Um, if you have any questions about this topic, I love talking sleep. Throw them in the chat or shoot me an email. Um, if you want more on sleep stuff, check out Matthew Walker. Check out uh, Huberman Lab Podcast or hop into the next eight-week uh, pain cohort starting um, on Monday because um, we dive into sleep for sure. Um, all right. Thanks for listening. Have an awesome day, everybody. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.